This is the first in a series of mini lectures on horror fiction and we're going to begin in this video with the historical antecedents. To understand horror we need to think a little about death and the treatment of the dead. Death is a tabooed subject in many ways even today, perhaps always will be, and the corpse is a tabooed object. This is for obvious reasons. The fact the human one knew is suddenly without animation is disorientating and more disturbing still the way the corpse decays, the bloating, the maggots, the stink, the spread of infection if left untreated or unburied. And hence the need to somehow deal with this extraordinary change that happens to all of us. We all know about the ancient Egyptians and the way they removed the organs of their pharaohs and preserved their bodies, entombed in the pyramids. But do you know what this is? It's an obol. I'll just show you a picture by the Pre-Raphaelite painter John Rodham Spencer Stanhope. Do you know who these characters are and hence what the obol was for? You can see better in this detail from the picture what is going on. Sharon is taking the coin from the mouth of Psyche. Psyche being, of course, the soul. So the obol was placed in the mouth of a dead person before burial, supposedly to pay Sharon, the ferryman, who took the soul across the river Styx from the land of the living to the land of the dead. So that's the ancient Greek myth. But did you know that scholars now believe it more likely the coin was actually placed on the mouths of the dead for reasons akin to those the Egyptians placed masks around the mouths of corpses? That is, as a seal to prevent the return of the soul. And across Europe, and indeed across the world, various strategies were employed for preventing the return of the dead. So in China and India, sacks of rice were placed in the coffin. In Europe, religious objects like crosses and crucifixes were laid on the corpse and other methods of preventing return to life of the deceased were employed, including burying the body upside down and cutting the tendons on the legs of the corpse so it could not stride out of the grave. So a horror at death and a fear of return of the dead runs right way throughout human cultural history. Now, before I leave the ancient realm, I should just mention Lilith. Here are three representations from three different periods. Firstly, an ancient Babylonian representation, though some scholars identify this as instead the Sumerian goddess Inanna. Another pre-Raphaelite painting by John Collier. You see how the Victorians were obsessed by vampires. And finally, a contemporary deviant art version. Now Lilith was the first wife of Adam, and depending on how you like to represent it, a wicked demon gone wrong, who didn't obey her husband and ended outcast as a result, replaced by the much nicer, if still fatally flawed, Eve, or alternatively, Lilith is regarded as the first rebel against God, against man, against patriarchy, a feminist icon and heroine. For our purposes, whichever way you swing, what's important is that this creature, who appears in Sumerian, Assyrian, Babylonian and Judean myths, and even makes a fleeting appearance in the Bible, supposedly flew out at night, seducing angels and men, killing babies and drinking their blood. For patriarchy, she's the bad Eve, the non-subservient female partner, the antithesis of a good mother and provider. Rather, a wild, untamed, seductress, stealer of sperm and babies. Wicked, in other words. She even supposedly killed her own babies. And before we leap a couple of millennia to the 17th and 18th centuries, I just add that throughout the period I'm skirting over, there were myths of Lamia, Striges, Incubi and Succubi, creatures of the night who seduced men and women in their sleep and feasted on the blood of the living. 
Incubi were said to seduce women and make them pregnant. There's a good excuse. Um, and succubi were said to lay with men and steal their sperm. No doubt for their own disgusting and devious purposes. So on the left we have John Henry Fuseli's The Nightmare. The mare being the mythical creature sat on the sleeping woman. A goblin, an incubi, that rides the woman at night, causing nightmares. On the right we have a more contemporary and stereotypical image of a succubi. We could even posit that the biblical myth of the virgin birth, Mary, the angel Gabriel and so on, is simply a traditional tale of an incubus penetrating a woman in her sleep. So as I said now, I'm going to skip to the 17th and 18th centuries as this is where the historical backdrop to the vampire myths and the great Gothic writings began. So what might surprise a contemporary sensibility which regards the supernatural as purely mythical, is that documented reports of real-life vampire cases were coming out of Eastern Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. In Kringa, a hamlet in Croatia, villagers claimed Jure Grando had returned from the dead. The dead man was supposedly rising from his grave at night, having carnal relations with his wife and preying upon the people, drinking their blood. Yore Grando's body was disinterred and a stake driven through his heart. The villagers finished by decapitating the corpse with an axe, or in some versions of the story, with a hacksaw. Perhaps more significant than this 17th century case were the 18th century cases of Petr Blagojevic and Arnold Paola of Serbia, who supposedly returned from the dead and killed a number of villagers. What's interesting about these cases is that the villagers complained about the spate of deaths to the military authorities, who sent an infectious diseases specialist to investigate. Dr Glazer dug up the corpses that had supposedly been killed by these vampires and found, to his surprise, that a number of the bodies had not decomposed and many were swollen, lifelike and had blood in their mouths. He called in the military surgeon, Johann Fluckinger, who turned up along with a number of other doctors to investigate. They dug up more graves and found that the dead indeed showed symptoms of being vampires. Fluckinger's report states that 12 cadavers were quite complete and undecayed, looked plump, the skin was red and vivid and the chests were full of fresh rather than coagulated blood. On some corpses, completely new nails were evident, along with a fresh and vivid skin. The conclusion of this documented scientific medical report was that, yes, indeed, some corpses were vampires. Now, the sources for all this information, um, when I first researched this, appeared to me a little dubious, and there were certainly a number of questionable web sources. Though since there's been relevant academic research done at the University of Zagreb and elsewhere, and I attended a talk in London by Deborah Hyde, who's a non-academic specialist in the area, who confirmed much of this information and was able to explain the lack of decay, blood and so forth by reference to contemporary forensic pathology. I also noticed that the sources of information have significantly increased of late, and I heard Professor David Punter talking about some of these cases on BBC Radio. And Punter is one of the most respected academics working in the area. So we certainly know the reports are real, whether or not you agree with Dr. Fluckinger's conclusion. An interesting addendum to the report was what the villagers did to the vampires. After the examination had taken place, the heads of the vampires were cut off by the local gypsies and burned along with the bodies, and then the ashes were thrown into the river Mareva. The decomposed bodies, however, were laid back into their own graves, which I attest along with those assistant medical officers provided for me. Actum ut supra L. S. Johannes Fluckinger, regimental medical officer of the foot regiment of the Honourable B. Furstenbush. This 
along with various other reports and vampire sightings, led to what became known as the 18th century vampire controversy, in which Fluckinger's report was cited widely in European newspapers, and this sparked off a great deal of interest, debate and controversy about the existence of vampires. And of course, writers of the period were very much influenced by this. And it's the literature that evolved out of this, the Gothic literature of the 18th century, that we'll examine in part two of The Horror. <laughs>